without further ado, we should introduce Anna. She's in Halifax, Nova Scotia, and she's probably going to tell us what she's studying <laughs> out at yeah. Dalhousie University. And, um, you know, um, Martin, her dad, and her mom, Shelly, they were around the Rockies for a, a long time and, um, and were well known in our club. And uh, with a lot of love, we welcome you here, Anna, tonight to tell this story. And thanks a million for doing this. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I wanted to thank Andrew for having me here. And um, yeah, so I've kind of divided this talk into two main parts. The first one is about his life, which is talking about his early climbing life, um, how he established his company in Seattle, and That's then also his expeditions in the Himalayas. And then the last uh, 10 to 15 minutes is about his legacy. And that's where I'll kind of talk about um, how everything affected me and kind of the legacy that he left. So without further ado, I will I'll start. Um, oh yeah, and the first, most of this was made, I haven't made this in the past week since I was invited to give this talk, but I made this in 2018 when I was presenting for the Czechoslovak Society of Arts and Sciences when I was 18 years old. So most of it was already put together, but the ending is new. So I will start. And okay. So like any person's story, it begins with two people. And those two people for Martin were his two parents. So Helena and Yaroslav, uh, my two grandparents. Um, Helena was originally from Benešov, a city about 45 minutes from Prague, which is, um, the capital, which is the capital city of what was then still Czechoslovakia. And Yaroslav met her there when he served in the army as a paratrooper and a driver for the army trucks. And they met at Helena's first ball. They got married after exchanging letters with each other for four years. And after Helena finished her teaching degree at Charles University, they got married December 10th, 1966 at Konopushka, which is a chateau just outside the city of Benešov. On November 27th, a year later, Martin was born um, and with his birth was not only great joy, but also loss because he was a twin and only he survived um, the birth. And a year later, they moved to Blatnička, which is a really small village in the Hodonín region. So Prague is here. So Helena grew up kind of around here. And then they moved to where Yaroslav's family lived and it's in South Moravia. So right close to this town here called Veseli nad Moravo. Um, and this is their village. This strip of um, houses is literally the entire village with about 450 people. And their house is right here. So they kind of live like up here by the church, um, across the street from the church. And so that's where I actually spend a lot of my summers pre-COVID uh, is at their house. Uh, Martin grew up surrounded by his family and a younger brother who was born, whose name was Tomash, whose name is Tomash. And um, yeah, he grew up surrounded by his uncle Stanya, his aunt Rose, um, his grandmother Marie and his grandfather Joseph. And as Martin was growing up, he was a really happy kid, um, very active. So there's him skiing and um, biking. And this is him wearing his traditional Czech clothing, which we call Kroy. Um, this next photo is them building their uh, their cabin everyone here calls their cabins cottages so I'm all mixed up but building a cabin in La Fenique and yeah here they're participating in what most people think is Czech's favorite activity which is mushroom picking so that's them enjoying time at the cottage slash cabin um, and then here um, they visited the Tetra Mountains a lot as Martin was growing up when he was in grade one he got bad pneumonia so the doctor suggested that they go to the Tatras um, to improve his respiratory health. So that's just them on one of their trips. And just, again, so we know where we are, the Czech Republic's here. Um, this was part of the same country back when my father was growing up. And then in Slovakia are the low Tatra mountains and the high Tatra mountains there. Uh, Martin spent nine years attending school in Blatnica, which was six kilometers from their small village, Blatnička. Helena was a teacher at the school and taught Martin Czech language class through grades six to nine. So he's right here. And then he continued his education at the age of 16 at a technical school that specialized in woodwork in Bystrice pod Hostinem, a town with a population of about 8,000 people. 
So this is Bistrice pod Hostinem, which is a town. And then Hostin is kind of um, a pilgrimage site up on top of this hill. And again, just so you know where we are, um, it's in the Zlin region. And then it's right here. So kind of right here on the map, um, the Czech Republic. So there he joined the climbing club with one of his classmates, Standa. And roughly two kilometers southeast of Svati Hostin, which is the pilgrimage site on the image I just showed, uh, lies eight rock formations of massive, massive sandstone. They call this location Skelmi. Each formation has a, specific, has a specific name correlated to something that it looks like. So this one is actually eagle. I don't know, I don't really see how it looks like an eagle, but that's what it's called. Um, and this is where the climbing club would climb. And they first gave Martin and Stenda, they wanted to climb right away, but the people there, they gave um, them a little bit of rope and carabiners and told them that they had to practice tying on the ropes and read this one intro to climbing book before they let them climb with them. So they did, and then they spent every free moment of their time climbing here. This is just a picture of the climbing club on the left. Um, this guy actually helped me put this, helped me a lot to put this presentation together in 2018 by providing me a lot of the materials and telling me a lot about my father's life. And so his name is Yeji Mehura, but we just all called him Mikesh. So I'll just call him Mikesh. And then my father is there. And this is their upright climb. Um, lots of drinking and playing guitar. <laughs> During the summer of 18, or 1984, Martin and Stenda were invited to go to a place called the Bohemian Paradise with the climbing club. And they climbed the massive sandstock rock towers, um, which wasn't easy, but they quickly learned how to tackle the roots. The following summer, Martin summited the highest mountain with his family in former Yugoslavia, which is Triglav. He took a hiking path to the top. So here is his mother, his younger brother, and Martin. And then he writes Mikesh, which was the gentleman I pointed out in the previous slide. Um, hello, now from the sea, we climbed Triglav. It's a climber's heaven. I look forward to climbing the rocks again. Don't forget about me, Martin. That same summer in August, Martin and Stenda spent a week with experienced climbers Ruda, Yarnod, and Lagya in the Tatra Mountains. One of, oh, one of them was their secondary school teacher. It was their first experience climbing something higher than 2,000 meters. So this was his first kind of actual summit. And it was um, Javi Hokonye or Javi Hakun right here. Um, so that was his first summit ever. And this was quickly followed by their second summit on the same trip, which was of Bolivish. And during the winter months, the climbing club would often cross country ski and uh, do other winter sports. That's just them. Um, during the winter months, okay. Uh, that February, the young climbers of the climbing club, except Sunda who had stopped climbing at this point, went on their next trip to the Tetras. Here they learned how to climb in the icy terrain. So this is just him learning how to climb in the winter conditions. Later that year, Martin graduated from secondary school and went on to another technical school in Slovakia. There was a similar technical school in Brno, which would have been much closer to where his parents lived, but this school was closer to the Tetra Mountains, so it was clear at this point that for him, climbing was beginning to be a really important and central thing in his life. And what's interesting here, um, this was his graduation card, and most people will put a picture of themselves or something else that's really important to him or to them, and here he placed um, carabiners, ropes, and mountains. So um, climbing was clearly becoming the most important thing to him. In 1987, Martin asked a man named Belo Kapulka if he would hire him as a porter for Teddy Hohat in the high Tetra Mountains, which is here. Belo didn't even want to hear this because he took one look at Martin's figure, tall and slim, and was like, no, you don't have the body to be a porter. Get out of here. But Martin was really persistent and really wanted to work here. So after asking him over and over, Bello said, if you can carry the weight of yourself on your shoulders, you can get hired here. So Martin did all 60 kilograms. So he became a porter. Um, so Martin attended school during the week and then he carried out, carried various supplies to, in the Tetras on the weekends. Martin was happy to do this kind of work, work because it allowed him to train, stay in one of the most beautiful huts in the Tetras for free and get paid for it. During Martin's time working in the Tetras, he would climb when he wasn't working as a porter and he climbed um, these four summits in one day solo. And these are just some more pictures of him climbing in the Tetras in the, in the winter.
After graduating from post-secondary school, Martin continued working as a porter throughout the summer and met an American group led by Walter Graymark from Poland. Walter didn't know much about the Tetras, so he asked Martin for his help, kind of planning the routes and leading his group. And in the group was a named was a nam was a man named Kara Zikan from Seattle, who was originally from near Brno, who now lives in America. And at this point in time, Martin was thinking of trying to travel to America because it was right after the Iron Curtain fell. But he needed a sponsorship at this point. So he asked Karel Zikan, who is on the trip, um, if he'd sponsor him. And um, Karel agreed. So the following fall, Martin attended English language school in Prague, obtained his visa after multiple repeated visits to the US Embassy, and then flew uh, to New York that January. His plan was to wash dishes in Boston for a month and then travel for a while before returning home. But when he got to New York, he called up Karel Zikan and he was just like, oh, forget washing, um, washing dishes in Boston, or in Boston, come to, um, or in New York, um, come to Seattle and like come live with, with me here. So Karel was living with his wife, Ellie Holmes, and they just um, would house a lot of Czech climbers. So it was kind of like a Czech climbing hostel in their house. And yeah, so he lived with Karel and did some traveling. And a month after he was in America, he was already calling his father Yaroslav, saying that he was bringing a group of Americans to Czechoslovakia and told him that his father spoke English and my grandpa didn't. So my grandpa had to learn English so they could lead this group of Americans. Uh, he had, ex my grandpa had experience uh, working in a travel company, but had no experience learning English. So he learned English in like less than half a year and he was 50 years old at that point. Um, yeah, and with his brother Tomasz, he led the first tour with Americans in the High Touches that June. Um, yeah, so these are just kind of pictures of the early trips. Um, and yeah, he basically just recruited Americans to go to Czech, Czechoslovakia still at that point and do tour guides with them. And he established a company called Romantic Czech Tours. <coughs> Uh, so in the summers, Martin would go back to Czech to organize and lead trips for these American tourists. And in the winter, he'd return to Seattle, where he had set up, uh, set up his office for their newly established travel company. Um, yeah, while in Seattle, he continued to stay with Karel and Ellie. He became a part of their family, spending time climbing and traveling together. They climbed all over Washington and California, and even Mount Robertson, the highest mountain in the Canadian Rockies. Uh, in 1995, Martin went on an expedition with Richard Oat, a professor of philosophy at Santa Cruz, who I believe is with us here tonight, and they climbed Cassine Ridge on Denali. Martin had met Richard climbing in Yosemite earlier that year and expressed a desire to go on a mountaining expedition in Alaska, alpine style. Martin had some experience mountaineering, which he gained while climbing Lenin Peak, which was just over 7,000 meters on the border of Tajikistan and Kyrgyzstan. Richard and Martin both had similar ideas of how to climb, which was with a light pack carried by themselves and in a self-sufficient manner. Yeah, so alpine style ref refers to climbing in a self-sufficient manner where you climb after acclimatizing, which is for those of you who aren't climbers here, kind of getting used to um, being in that elevation. And the other style of climbing used is expedition style, which is when you have a series of small camps along the mountain. Um, in between camps are fixed ropes. So they wanted to climb it alpine style, which was self-sufficient. <laughs> um, Cassine Ridge does not have a high success, high rate of success. Many climbers turned back before even beginning the expedition, but Martin and Richard took on the challenge. They spent about two weeks on their expedition, running out of food towards the end and facing horrendous weather. But due to Martin's persistence making the top, they hit the summit on the summer solstice on June 21st. Then Martin was drafted into the army. After this expedition, um, he went to go to the army because he had kept putting it off and just wanted to get it over with. Um, his ability to speak English was really valuable to them and he served as a journalist. So he reported on what other countries were saying about the Czech Republic to the Ministry of Defense, which is in the middle there, whose name is Rudolf Holang. Um, and my grandpa, I don't know if this is true or not, but my grandpa also says that he was the personal party planner of NATO. He organized their music or something. So I can believe that. Um, after that, uh, he returned to the other side of the world, and in 1998, he climbed the Polish glacier on the east face of Aconcagua, which lies in the Andes of Chile. It's the highest mountain in the world outside of Asia. He was forced to climb the Silo because at the last minute, his group of friends decided to back out.
Uh, and three months later, Martin attempted to, to, to traverse Mount Logan by ascending the East Ridge and descending the King Trench. He spent hours researching for this expedition in the Mountaineers Library in Seattle and talked to a person who had climbed the East Ridge the previous year. Three of his close friends had agreed to climb with him, but had changed their minds last minute. Feeling betrayed by them, Martin hitchhiked on the Alaska Highway from Whitehorse to Klein Lake. He didn't want to give this up after weeks of intensive planning. And the pilot, which, so that's their, their, the plane there, the pilot usually asks for money um, when the groups of people are returning back when he has to come pick them up, but he wanted payment in advance because I don't think he thought my father was going to make it. So as Martin made his way up the mountain, a big storm hit. There was snow up to Martin's knees, so he was forced into a crawl. He occasionally ran into other climbers and, previous, and used previously built snow caves for shelter. Climbers usually climb to the summit and return leaving their large packs behind, but not Martin. He was committed to crossing the mountain and had to take his packs with him. <coughs> Martin left his pack just below the summit and reached the summit on his knees without having anything to eat or drink in 24 hours, taking 40 steps at a time. After making the summit, he headed down to where he had left his pack and began the traverse. The winds had completely died down, allowing him to make himself some food and water. On his way down, he fell into a crevasse, but thankfully only up to his waist. The next days after rehydrating and sleeping, he headed further down where he met groups of people. Days later, he was hitchhiking back from Killian Lake, back to Whitehorse. This expedition, expedition was a huge success for Martin. He was the first person in the world to solo traverse Mount Logan. He received a lot of media attention from this climb since it had never been done before. He was also included in Chick Scott's book, Pushing the Limits, which is a comprehensive book about the history of Canadian mountaineering. More excitement followed after this expedition. For example, Martin met my mother, Shelley, and this is where the CMC actually comes in. So my mom was living in Calgary at the time and she was involved with the CMC. And she had been planning to hike around Romania because she was planning a trip to Europe. And she asked the CMC, one of her CMC friends, if they knew someone who had been to Romania, if they could kind of give her some advice of where to go, where not to go. And this person um, recommended, he, she talked to my father because my father had given a talk at the CMC um, and he thought that my father was Romanian and not Czech. So my mom emailed him and he said that he's not Romanian, but that he would suggest that she visit the Tatra Mountains instead. So when my mom went on a holiday, holiday she climbed um, the French and Swiss, Swiss Alps, and then she was making her way to Poland to visit some relatives. And she ended up stopping in the Tatra Mountains and met my dad who was leading one of the trips there. So um, a year or two later, um, I was born in Calgary on Easter Sunday, April 23rd. Um, then on July 26th, my parents got married um, on a mountain, of course. Uh, it's on Mount Yum they got married on Mount Yamneska. So when you're driving from Calgary to Canmore, it's one of the first mountains that appears on your right. So that's their wedding. Um, after that, we moved to Seattle and we lived there for three years until my mom was expecting my brother. Um, so this is where his uh, office was. So the Romantic Trip Tours office. So he was working there, recruiting Americans to go on these trips that he would lead in the summer. And he bought a house with his younger brother Tomas, who's here. And then his parents actually flew over as well. Um, and they were celebrating the success of the company and then my parents' marriage. Um, things really took off for the company because in addition to running tours through their own company, they offered services through other travel companies such as Wilderness Travel, REI, and Avanti. A yeah, and so this is a celebration in Seattle. And this is a card. So this is a picture from the REI Adventures trip catalog featuring Martin, who is the main tour guide. That's him. These are kind of information about the trips. And these are just some pictures uh, that were taken during various trips with the tourists. The tourists who went on these trips were mostly from San Francisco, Oregon, and the Pacific Northeast. Um, I just want to take a second to talk about kind of Martin's passion for what he did. He really loved what he did. I mean, he established a company just by talking to people had a great sense of humor, thoughtful, caring, and was honest, but direct with a lot of charisma. Um, I love this photo because it really captures his passion for his job. And that same passion extended to his biggest hobby, which is mountaineering. I think that it was his passion that drove his perseverance to continue on climbing in bad weather and continuing and attempting to summit the world's largest mountains. I think he learned through mountaineering and through his business that you will only, that you will come across many obstacles in your life, but that you cannot avoid them, but instead you have to conquer them.
And with that, I will transition into talking about the 8,000ers. So, um, um, yeah, from 1999, he began making expeditions to the Himalayas and nothing but the Himalayas. And it's a mountaineer's, mountaineer's dream and ultimate goal to climb the 14 highest peaks of the world, which are called the 14 8,000ers. And this is just a map of Nepal outlining the 14 8,000ers. Um, Reinhold Messner was the first Austrian Italian or he was Austrian Italian and he was the first to accomplish this task in 1986. So summoning all of them. Um, Martin never used oxygen on any of his mountaineering expeditions because he really wanted to feel like he was at the elevation that he was at. And he also didn't use like Sherpas to get up to the summit. I did, they'd get help getting all, all their supplies to base camp and then he'd have a base camp cook, which I'll talk about later, but um, he really wanted to climb in a self-sufficient way without oxygen. Here's an overview of the mountains that he climbed. Um, I'm not going to go into detail of all of them just for the sake of time, but they, he does have expedition journals on his website, which is here. So feel free to take a look um, if you're ever interested. Mm -hmm. That's his website. So after gaining both experience and confidence on Mount Logan, Martin went on his first Himalayan expedition to climb Manaslu. He went with a small group compromised of a couple of Canadians from Saskatchewan and two Americans from the Los Angeles area. Most of the team was successful on this climb, including Martin. The next year, he went on a Czech expedition led by Josef Šimone uh, to attempt to summit Kanchenjunga, but their attempt was unsuccessful. On this expedition, he met Radek Jarosz. Radek liked Martin and saw that he knew what he was doing and a pleasant guy to be around. So Radek said that the next trip that he organizes, he'll invite Martin. So this is me uh, when my dad was coming back from that expedition and I would have been happy to see him, but I don't think I recognized him uh, with the beard. Um, and then two years later, Martin attempted to climb Kanchenjunga again, but this time with a much smaller group. So Radek Jarosz, Zdenia Kurubi, and himself. They climbed it expedition style, which is when you go up and down camps, gradually getting higher. So Sherpas helped them bring all the supplies uh, to the base camp, but after that, they were on their own. Martin was technically the first Czech to ever summit Kanchenjunga. Stanjak and Radek had to turn back because they weren't doing so well. However, Radek tried again the following day and made it. So both Radek and Martin were successful. Um, and the next thing is a short video clip, about three minutes of him climbing on Kanchenjunga. And Radek Jarosz would make these kind of summary videos. They were about 20 minutes long. And I basically shortened them to only include like where Martin was mostly. And yeah, I added subtitles because it's all in Czech and you're going to have to forgive the music. It's just representative of that time. Stalo nás nepříjemný překvapení, protože v místě, kde minule nespadla ani jediná vločka, tak tentokrát byl bejskem zavalovaný neustálým přívalem a sněhu. Ten číslo je na 6000 metrů. Tady se pomalu zabydlujeme. Na každém kroku nás ohrožovaly nebezpečné trhliny skrytí pod sněhem a seraky hrozící každou chvíli zřícením. Výškový tábor v 6700 metrech. Už při jeho budování jsme těžce omrzli. V tomhle stavu úplně pod sněhem jsme ho nacházeli skoro pravidelně. S lopatou a v rukavicích je to nepředstavitelná dřina, ale filmovat ve vychřici s holýma rukama je strašný. Vyrážili jsme v jednu noci a bohužel 
nahoru se v poslední fázi vydal pouze Martin, protože já a Zdenek jsme se vrátili zcela zničený do stanu a vypadali jsme takhle. Although Zdeněk didn't reach the top, their group's success was still big news in the Czech Republic. They had many interviews and gave many talks following their return. They even made it on the Czech TV in a documentary about Czech expeditions to Kanjinyoga and Manasu. So this is Zdeněk Jarosz, which um, Andrew was talking about before this presentation started. And he was kind of a full-time climber sports guy. And this is Zdeněk Hrubý, and he was the deputy finance minister of the Czech Republic and professor of economics at Charles University in Prague and later the head of the Czech National Climbing Entity. And then that's my dad. Um, so then the following year in June, the three musketeers, as they were called, attempted to climb Broad Peak and K2, expedition style in a two month period. Their main objective was to climb K2. They attempted Broad Peak two times and they made it on their third attempt. They all summited base camp together, which was really special because this doesn't always happen when you're climbing in the group. And they also attempted K2 eight times, but, but unfortunately, Due to harsh weather, they were unable to make it to the top. Um, yeah, so they were the second group of Czechs to reach the top of Broad Peak. And here's another short video from Radek Jarosz. <laughs> Oh man, it's pouring off of way up there. Tohle je všechno, co nás bylo z třetího výškového tábora na Brad Peak. Thank <laughs> you. 
Um, yeah, so it was the, the short video. Um, and the following year in September, the three musketeers and Petr Mashek attempted climbing Shisha Pengma, but instead of climbing an expedition style like their previous expedition, so setting up camps along the way, they climbed alpine style, which again, just means climbing in a self-sufficient manner, carrying up all your own supplies as opposed to setting up a fixed line of stocked camps on the mountain. Uh, Martin took a particular liking to Petr because now he had someone to play chess with, which you'll see in the last really short erotic video. Um, and just two things I wanted to point out from the video. So before every one of their expeditions in the Himalayan mountains, the Sherpas perform a puja ceremony, which is being done right here. Um, yeah, so a cairn is built and prayer flags are strung from the puja pole and rice and flour are thrown for good luck. During the ceremony, meditational prayers are offered to the Buddhas and holy beings to request their blessings for help and to avert obstacles and conditions which prevent people from achieving worldly or spiritual goals. Before every climb, Sherpas perform this prayer ceremony to bless the team in climbing gear, and they actually refuse to go above base camp unless the ceremony is um, done. Um, and then you'll see them also acclimatizing to ice tooth in the video. Um, yeah, and that's just to get yourself acclimatized or adapted to the lack of oxygen available. So here's the last um, climbing video. And that board just means camp. So camp one, two. Jak ty pańskie barony?
Jeden kilometr jízdy zdarma. Ale <laughs> podle toho, jak máš nasazenou helmu, tak očekáváš úder do týla, teda spíš než do čela. Já jsem projektil menší než jen jsem byl do cestou počítat. Volba do ramena, šuter do ruky, do přilby to ani nepočítá. Ale stejně nejlepší je, že máme střechu nad hlavou. Já myslím, že ta vrstva, vrstva ledu nad náma je taková, že tím nemůže nic propadnout. Medvěd Nordník tady s náma asi. Uklad. Asi jsem moc zebral. Tady jsem chtěl mít zrovna hlavu zase. Všem jenom konec. No, tak ji budeme traverzovat. Chlapáci. A jsme zase všichni na kopci kurva. So if you noticed in this last video, Martin got extremely tired towards the end. Radek and Zdeněk were both older than Martin and they did a lot more endurance training for these expeditions than Martin did. Um, and they told Martin if he wanted to continue climbing with them on the next expedition that he'd have to put more training in and because they wouldn't want to carry their dead friend down the mountain. Again, this is only one side of the story, so I don't really know what happened, but they, um, from this point on, they didn't really climb together. Um, and just kind of a bit about where Radek and Zanyak ended up. So Radek um, went on with his expeditions and in 2014, he became the first Czech to reach all 14,000ers and became 15th person in the world to do it without supplemental oxygen. And Zdeněk continued climbing and reached eight of the world's 8,000ers, but died at age 57 in 2013, climbing Gashford Broom 1, when he fell into a deep crevasse. Um, Martin, David's, David's, Martin and Shelley's son David was born that following December on the 28th. Um, the company that he established still kept growing, so Martin and Yaroslav bought a sailboat in Croatia and kept it in Biograd so they could expand their tours to Croatia and more specifically the Adriatic Sea. Martin named 54 foot on Odyssey Janu, which, was a mount which is a mountain beside Kanchenjunga, and he said he really liked the shape of it, so he named his boat after it. Um, and next I have about a 20 second clip um, of my dad on the boat because I feel like the videos I've showed before, he's very serious, and I just wanted to show like this other side of him, and it was just a guy who was full of life. So it was a very short clip. Yeah, so it was just to clip. Uh, the next spring, he attempted Shoyu and Everest. This was a solo trip because he was no longer climbing with his three musketeers. Um, and he only went with his base camp cook, Temba Sherpa. When he arrived at base camp of Shoyu, there was no other current expedition. So he was really happy to kind of just have the mountain to himself. Um, while attempting to summit Shoyu, um, as he wrote in his expedition journals, hell broke loose and he was confined to his tent without a chance to move up or down or to make water. Hallucinations came because of the complete lack of water. The next day, he climbed down to Camp 1, where some fellow climbers shared their water with him before he continued his way down to the base camp. He made another attempt, spending a night in a shallow crevasse and summited on April, 20, on April 18th with, quote, no emotions, but constant fear. Uh, from what I read in Martin's expedition entries, he was not a fan of Everest, or rather the large crowd that was attracted to it and the army of Sherpas they brought with him. He was a bit disgusted by like kind of the circus that Everest had become and that just wasn't his style of climbing. Um, he continued to try and reach the summit um, four days without food and a sleeping bag on Everest, but he knew that he was at his limit, so he turned back and collected his belongings on the way down. And this photo is Martin with Elizabeth Holly, 
who is an American journalist and chronicler of the Himalayan expedition. So she's quite famous and well known. The following April, instead of another solo expedition, Martin went on an expedition with his good friend, Pavel Kalni, who had two kids, who Martin had known for 17 years. Pavel was a psychiatrist who had some experience mountaineering, but he had never climbed in the, in the, Himalayas, in the Himalayas before, but he had also um, traversed Mount Logan as Martin had done in 1999. This expedition on Lhotse was done alpine style, so they climatized and made several attempts. They set up camp at about 8,100 meters. And then on the, the next morning on the radio, they got news that a Czech climber had hurt himself on the face of Lhotse. So they didn't know who it was for a while. So my mom was actually at a conference in Quebec City at the time. And she knew like from the radio that um, that there was a climber that was hurt that was Czech, um, but she didn't know it was Martin or if it was Pavel, but it was Pavel who ended up being hurt. Um, I'm not really sure what happened after this point, but from, Mikesh, from what Mikesh told me, Pavel was beginning to lose his vision. So Martin decided that they were gonna turn around and go back to base camp and heading down, Martin took his eyes off Pavel to reach an energy bar for him from his pocket. But when he looked up where Pavel had previously stood, he was gone. Pavel had fallen about 200 meters. Later 20 Sherpas tried to bring Pavel to a lower, a lower elevation of 6,500 meters where he could be rescued by a helicopter. Um, but their attempt to save him was unsuccessful. They lost Pavel on May 10th, 2006 at 1 p.m. at 7,350 meters. Two days later, Martin arrived at base camp, completely dehydrated, severely frostbitten, bitten on his right foot and with a broken heart. Martin had to be carried down to the location that um, a helicopter could come and get him at a lower elevation because he was no longer capable of walking by himself. Um, the next slide is a little disturbing with some frostbitten toes. So if you need to look away, please do so. So Martin made his way back to the Czech Republic and on May 20th, he was admitted to the University of Olomouc Hospital in the Department of Plastic Surgery. He was scheduled for an amputation of three of his toes, but Dr. Zalashak, the surgeon proposed that they do a transplant instead, so a procedure that he had learned in Brazil just earlier that year. So in a seven hour surgery, they took skin from his lower stomach and used it on his frostbitten toes. The attempt was successful. And post-operation, Martin was given instructions to drink only alcohol to open up his blood vessels so that the transplanted skin would join better to his feet. So all of his friends brought him alcohol after all it was doctor's orders and his room was nicknamed the bar of frozen feet. This experience at Lhotse in 2006 changed Martin, but it did not stop Martin from doing what he loved most. The following year, he returned to Lhotse with a group of friends, climbers, and academic sculptor, Altamar Oliva, to place a commemorative plaque for Pavel by Lhotse. So Altamar is this man here. And um, yeah, he was a very, a famous sculptor and he's sculpted things for the, for the Vatican as well. So um, he was really close with Martin. Um, yeah, so that's just placing the memorial plaque up and Martin placing it. Um, and his friends kind of hung out for a few days before heading back, but Martin stayed and tried to summit Lhotse. And my uncle told me that before my father went on this expedition, Martin told him that he was either going to summit Lhotse or die trying, because I think that was his way of coming to terms with whatever happened um, with Pavel on that trip. So he climbed it and he, he summited. So I think that was, um, that was his way of kind of Pavel letting him know um, that whatever happened, like it was okay. I just want to take a minute to talk about my, the relationship between Martin and the Sherpa people. Um, Martin had great respect for the Sherpas, describing them as great mountain people. And when the Sherpas realized that Martin carried all of his own, own equipment and really tried to climb in a self-sufficient style, they had a lot of respect for him too, calling them one of their own. Uh, Martin and Tembo were very, very close and, um, yeah, they were, they were great friends. The next spring in March, Martin climbed the west face of Dalgary, Alpine style again. He acclimatized with two Russian climbers, climbed to camp two in 11 hours where he spent the night on a tiny ledge with his ex-climbing partners, Denyak and Radek. The next morning he continued up, finding shelter under a rock, leaving everything there except a bottle of water and his down jacket. He reached the summit later that day on April 23rd, my birthday in the dark. Then he climbed down and arrived to where he left his gear at 8 a.m. That same year in the fall, he returned to the Himalayas again, this time to climb Annapurna with Dodo Kapolt, who was a Slovak, and Petr Mašek. Annapurna is considered to be the most dangerous mountain to climb in the world. 
While it's only the 10th highest in the world, it's statistically the most dangerous, having a fatality to summit ratio at 32%. So for every three climbers trying to summit, one will die trying um, attempting it. Um, yeah, so these are just pictures. Um, this is kind of just showing the conditions that they were in. They were unsuccessful at this um, on that attempt. When Martin returned from the expedition, he had to receive treatment for his frostbitten toes because when they transplanted skin from his stomach, obviously that skin um, isn't the same as skin on your feet. So it's way more um, subject to get damaged again because it's more sensitive. And you see before he's even uh, fully recovered from this, he has the map of Annapurna again um, and planning his next expedition to Annapurna. Uh, that Christmas, my brother and I traveled to the Czech Republic. Um, we spent it mostly skiing at their kind of family cabin. And that was our first. And since then, we haven't been back for Christmas. At the end of March 2009, Martin flew with Dodo Capult to Kathmandu, where they met Elizabeth Revel, an experienced French alpinist. The three of them built their base camp below Annapurna's south face and attempted to climb the Bonington route. After several attempts in horrendous weather, all the other climbers in the other expeditions retreated along with Dodo. Martin and Elizabeth, however, continued on, this time attempting to climb along the East Ridge. Martin texted one of his expedition updates. Annapurna is confirming its strong reputation. After two weeks, we didn't get any higher than 5,500 meters. We were buried, buried under the avalanche. We were falling into crevasses, but still we have a fancy to climb it. Annapurna has several summits, and on April 19th, they summited the East Summit, but were unable to summit the Central, su the Central Summit due to the conditions. Elizabeth described the wind sounding like jet, jet engines, but they still managed to push through the top. They weren't well acclimatized, so Martin had a terrible headache. He was so exhausted descending that when they reached his camp, Martin went straight into his tent and slept, um, just taking his crampons off. The next day they descended further, but due to Martin's exhaustion, they both descended very slowly. Martin's hands and face were swollen and it took him three hours to get ready that morning. That morning, Elizabeth would break trail and then wait for him to catch up every half hour. And then he didn't catch up. Visibility was terrible. It was only possible to see two meters in front of you. And after an hour, Elizabeth started to backtrack to where she had left him, but he was nowhere in sight. It was snowing so badly that the tracks had been covered. She waited and called and searched for him, but she had to make a choice, stay there and risk her own life or continue descending. She had to continue descending down. It took her another day to make it down and she notified of everyone of Martin's disappearance. A helicopter with a couple of Sherpas and Elizabeth was sent to look for the 42 year old Martin. They looked for five days, but they were unable to find him and didn't return. Um, yeah, so this is kind of the part um, where I could talk a bit more about how uh, this all affected me. And so he didn't return from this trip they he went missing and they searched for him but they never found his body um so martin was left in the mountains and that's where he'll he'll be um and i don't think he would have had it any other way i think that's kind of where his heart was um so a little bit about kind of the legacy that he left so his story doesn't end on annapurna in 2009 um yeah his friends otmar oliva the famous sculptor had made three kind of memory plaques for him. So the first one was placed at Svitsarna, which is a place where, um, let me just get my notes. Uh, it's a place in, Yesen in Yeseniki Mountains and at the chalet in Svitsarna, there's a symbolic place dedicated to climbers who've lost their lives and stayed in the mountains forever. So they added his plaque to, um, to this place and that's kind of the view um, of the Yesenyiki Mountains and that's the hut and um, Temba Sherpa actually came to the Czech Republic for this kind of celebration of life um, thing that they had for my father and that's Mikesh who was the one who got him into climbing when he was in secondary school and who helped me put this presentation together and that's my grandfather. They also put a second commemorative plate in Skalni. So that's where he first started climbing where those eight sandstone formations were. And then on Oct in October the following year, um, a group of 12 of his friends went to Nepal and there's Tempa Sherpa again uh, to place this, another commemorative pla um, plaque in Annapurna or in the Annapurna region. Um, I think it was in the Nang region. 
Um, yeah, and this plaque was really special because we all got to kind of con contribute something to it. So we were all sent some, we were all sent clay and we were able to kind of make something that we wanted. And then we sent it back to Otmar who welded it together into this beautiful kind of wreath. Um, so this is mine, I made a flower there. Um, my brother kind of made this ship and then my grandma had made this kind of this heart here. So we were all able to do that. So it was a really special um, plaque that I hope to visit one day. And um, so when Martin died, he had, he had two kids. It wasn't just all these memorial plates that were left for him. And I wanted to kind of take a little, take maybe five or 10 minutes. Um, I know it's kind of getting late for the people in Halifax here, but to talk about how this affected my life and yeah, and it's not something that I share too often. Um, and yeah, but I thought it would be important to share and I'll kind of get a little bit into that in a few slides. But yeah, so kind of from our perspective, um, it was my ninth birthday and I was buying a birthday cake and I was leaving the grocery store with my mom. And as we were entering the parking lot, my mom ran into my girl guide leader and I had gone to the car. And when I looked back, I saw that my mom was crying and I was really confused of why she was so upset. And I asked her what was wrong. And she said like, nothing, nothing, don't worry about it. And so I had my pajama party with my friends when my friends ended up sleeping over. And the next morning, my mom told me that my father had gone missing. And so the party was over at that point. My friend went home and I was very, I don't know. I think I knew that that was kind of it. I didn't, I didn't really think they were going to find him, but uh, so a week later when, a week later, uh, I had two close family friends who I'm still in touch with today. Um, they came over and we were sitting in my living room and they told us that they had stopped looking for my dad. And I don't really remember how long we were sitting there or what was said, what, was, what wasn't said, but I do remember my brother asking, who was only six at the time. So you know, as a six-year-old, you, you, it's hard to even understand the concept of like a parent not coming back. And he asked my mom, you know, does this mean we're never going to see him again? And my mom just said, yes, like, this does, this means that you're never going to see him again. And, um, you know, life kind of went on after that. We, it's not like we were missing this huge, huge part because he wasn't around that much when we were growing up, especially when my brother was born, when they were expecting my brother, my mom moved to back to Canmore. And my dad spent a lot of time, as you know, in the Himalayas, climbing the 8,000ers and then in Seattle, recruiting Americans and doing his business stuff. And then in the summer, he'd spend time um, being one of the main tour guides for his company. So it's not like he was in our lives every single day. Um, so him not coming back, it wasn't like this huge change in our lives. So things kind of went on. We ended up going to this rock and gem show later that day with the family friends that came over. Um, yeah, like life kind of went on and we moved from, we had to move, I think it was, we had to move to another house in Canmore. And then we had to move to Edmonton because my mom had gotten a job in Edmonton uh, where we had a bit more support from my mom's side of the family. And that was a really, really hard transition just because I was going into grade six. I had, I didn't know anything about Edmonton. I didn't want to go. I didn't want to leave Canmore. I mean, who would want to leave Canmore to go to Edmonton? Probably not many people. And yeah, um, was really involved with biathlon and cross country skiing. Um, then I transitioned into coaching when I was there and I'd go to the Czech Republic in the summers to visit my grandparents. And yeah, then, um, I've kind of skipped forward to 2017 when I got a call from my mom who was in on a trip in Jasper with my brother and she told me that she wanted to tell me this over the phone because she didn't want me reading it in the news and that's when we heard that Richard Baruta died in a climbing accident in Alberta and Richard um it was very ironic because the last place where I'd ever seen my dad was at his house him and Kamala's house and they were also Czech and they had two kids. And I wasn't, when my mom first told me the news, um, I mean, obviously I was upset, but it wasn't so much because I had lost, you know, um, he was a biathlon coach as well. So I'd see him at my biathlon races in Canmore and he was a family friend, 
but I was so distraught and heartbroken for his kids because it wasn't just like we had experienced it was you know he was in his kids lives every single day so I just couldn't even imagine like what his kids were going through um because they'd they just have this huge hole in their heart um so he went to his celebration of life and I saw Kamala which was his wife and it was really hard um and I saw the kids there and his older son knew what was going on and was sad and the younger one was closer to my brother's age at the time when we found out our dad wasn't coming home and he was just running around with his friends and wasn't really sure what was happening and I just really I felt for them and um yeah so that same year I was in grade 12 and I I think I started thinking more after this incident about like my dad and climbing because it wasn't something that I really thought too much about growing up and in 2018 that's when I decided to put this presentation together and present to the Czechoslovak Society of Arts and Sciences about my father's life and I realized making that presentation I didn't know anything about his life like I knew some things but I had never really done a deep dig of his website or anything just because I just didn't I just don't think I want to deal with it. I'm not sure. But I started to, and I started to talk to his friends and talk about what he was like and things like that. And that's what, like everything that I was able to find is in the presentation I just showed you. Um, anyway, so as I was getting all of this ready, Mikesh, who I've mentioned several times, he was the one sending me most of the material. And one morning he sends me this article and I opened the article and, um, it's a it's an article about Elizabeth Ravel, who was the same French alpinist who was with my dad when he went missing and didn't come home, that she had left this Polish climber, uh, Tomasz, um, on a mountain. And it, things just really hit me after reading this article. And I um, he had three kids. And again, just the fact that he had three kids, it made it super hard. And I remember kind of this anger surfacing that I didn't know existed and I was just so angry like how can climbers leave climbers like especially if they have families like how does that even happen and it was something that I was just so angry about and so upset about and I called my close family friend in Canmore Leanne um she's the mom of one of my friends growing up and I was telling her how I was feeling and you know I just didn't get it and she told me that she'd actually just watched a documentary about Messner, who was that Italian climber who had climbed the first 14 8,000ers, or the first person to climb all the 14 8,000ers. And she was like, I watched this documentary and I didn't really understand, you know, why climbers do what they do and why people are left behind. But I watched this and after watching this, like, I kind of think I have a better understanding. So she suggested I watch it. So the next day I skipped school and I watched it. And, um, um, in this documentary, uh, Messner leaves his own brother behind. And it's like, if someone left their own sibling behind, like, it's just, I don't really know. I can't really tell you what, what clicked in me or anything, but a part of me was just like, okay, like if he left his brother, like, it's just something that's kind of beyond what, what I understand. And I don't, I don't think I came at peace with it, but, um, it definitely helped me kind of deal with those feelings that resurfaced, um when this was happening um yeah and then kind of after that happened um i was in grade 12 so i gave that presentation to the society um when i was 18 and then around the same time i got a leadership scholarship to come to dalhousie and that's when i came here and you know being 18 you're all independent i was thinking about traveling and things like that so i got in contact with the sherpas that my dad had known um, and that's when I learned that Temba, um, Temba, who's in this image here, his daughter goes to this disabled rehabilitation center in Nepal. Um, and she was physically disabled. And it's, it's this place that houses children who are physically disabled or orphaned and kind of provides them um, help with affording their education and a place to live and things like that. And I kind of wanted to do something. Um, I want, as my mom says, um, I tried to turn something positive something negative into something positive, but it was really, um, I knew that Temba had done so much for my father and I wanted to be able to give back in some way. So I started a society with some of my friends in university in my second year. And we called ourselves students, or we call ourselves students supporting Nepalese children. 
and we just do a variety of fundraisers throughout the year. And um, yeah, we've, we've made this, it's now a nonprofit. And yeah, to date we've raised um, just over $5,400. And just to put that into kind of understanding terms of what that can do, um, tuition for one year, sorry. So it's about $500 to cover tuition uh, for one student for one year. So that's um, almost 11 children, but it covered for 10 children. And so, yeah, we've been working towards this and, you know, being able to um, raise money for these kids um, has been really rewarding for me. And I've been able, I've, through that, I learned how to start my own initiatives and kind of lead a team, make a team and kind of get things done. And it's just been great experience all around. Um, and we've had about 30 members um, and more, uh, it fluctuates and as new people come in and leave and graduate. But yeah, so we're really proud of what we've been able to do. And we're actually sending money on June 1st. Um, so I do have um, some information about how you can donate if you're able to um, at the end of this presentation. Uh, everything, um, every dollar counts. So we'd really appreciate that. And what else did I want to say about this? Um, yeah, Nepal is really struggling right now. Um, what's happening in India in terms of COVID is spilling over to them. And a lot of our friends there, they're telling us like, they're just, they're seeing a lot of people die. So it's been really difficult for them to get the normal amount of donations that they usually can get from the tourists coming in and seeing the kids at the center or people in the local community. So yeah, if you are able to give a bit at the end, that would be amazing. Um, and then I just wanted to talk a little bit more about the second reason I kind of decided to get really personal with everyone here about how um, my father, like my father um, being lost in the mountains kind of affected us. And so through different kind of events, you know, feelings resurfaced. So when Richard died and when that article was released about Elizabeth Rebel and, and Tomas the Climber, um, Anyway, so I was planning on going to Maastricht in um, the Netherlands for an exchange for my third year. And I had arranged to go to Nepal um, for two months to work at the center and to go and do some trekking and things like that. But then COVID hit, c'est la vie, and I stayed here. And for me, it was fine, like no problem. I, I'll just kind of do other things. I'll join other things. I'll take other classes. Um, but as I'm sure for many of you, COVID was a really difficult time and um, my anxiety got a lot worse. And I don't think I really had anxiety before, but um, things got really hard, especially in January and February, this past January and February. And um, yeah, it wasn't really, um, I'm lucky to work in a faculty that really, because I study neuroscience, I work in a faculty that supports um, kind of mental health and mental wellness. So I had some friends who suggested, you know, maybe I should talk to a therapist about, you know, like why this is happening. I went to go talk to a therapist and I had never seen one before. And she just said like, you know, have you ever said goodbye to your dad? And I, I was like, I don't, I don't think so. And I really thought about it and I hadn't, you know, there was all those celebrations for him with his friends, but it wasn't something that um, us kids or my mom could really attend. It's like my mom is now a single parent and has two children. Like we can't just, she can't just fly us there. So we never really had a chance. And, you know, I don't think I really dealt with anything because, you know, growing up, you know, we moved to Edmonton and it was only during a few different periods of time, like when Richard died, where some of those feelings resurfaced. And um, yeah, so after talking to someone about it, I've started to kind of deal with some of the grief that I've never really been able to deal with before. And it wasn't until I recently met and got close with um, a few people who've also lost parents at a very young age that I really realized like, it's okay to not be okay. You know, this happened 12 years ago and like, it's okay to still be upset some days about it. And when, sometimes it's really hard you know, I'm so grateful for the families I've gotten to be a part of, um, but sometimes it's really hard seeing like a happy family and like this family unit because it's something that I, I never had. But um, yeah, with that, I'd like to kind of talk about um, 
kind of a bit of a jump. So I actually spoke with Max Lowe last week on Monday, who's this gentleman here, and he's the son of Alex Lowe and stepson of Conrad Anker, who are very, very well-known American Alp um, American climbers. And um, I didn't really know what to expect when I called him, but when I called him, um, we kind of shared each of our stories and I realized like how parallel our stories were. Like it was around his 11th birthday that his father died in an avalanche in the Himalayas. Um, I think it was Chisha Pengma. And yeah, it was one of those, it was so crazy to just talk to someone who had like an absolute parallel experience to me. And through talking to him, you know, I realized like going to Nepal isn't gonna just fix everything. Um, you know, dealing with grief, you have to deal with it in your own way. And um, yeah, so I think talking to him really shed some light about um, the importance of kind of telling your story because he said that he didn't really start to deal with any of his grief until he started telling his story to other people. So that's one of the reasons um, I wanted to kind of tell my story today. And another reason is, um, you know, telling his story and telling my story have helped, but um, there's a lot of children who've lost climbers who, who don't know that or who could use that extra support. So that's one of the things that I'm hoping to kind of get out of this and start the conversation for how we can support people who have lost, um, whether it's like family member or a close friend to climbing. Um, and I'll talk about that in a, a little bit more in a second. I promise I'm almost done. Um, and yeah, so it's hard because I experienced um, one of the closest people to me dying at a very young age. And it's something that we're all gonna experience at some point in our lives. And I think it's really important just to remember that just because someone dies doesn't mean like, you know, you're just gonna get over it in a year. Like it's always gonna be a part of you. And it's important to kind of find ways to remember them and to kind of address that that happened. Um, so I just wanted to kind of show some pictures of how like I've been able to find ways to remember. Um, and yeah, like going on these trips, I've had so many interesting and great experiences, um, like visiting my grandparents every summer. And I went and climbed the mountain that my parents got married on. Or when I hiked to the hut that my dad was a porter at and I went with one of my friends and we learned the importance of why you shouldn't start a road trip at 10 p.m. Um, or I was able to kind of spend some time with my dad's friends when we went to his memorial plaque in the Yosemite Mountains or that my brother is an amazing climber and I get to see him it just, yeah, he's, he's great. Um, yeah, and I just wanted to kind of say, um, you know, I didn't grow up without a dad but I grew up without a dad. Um, but it takes a village to raise a child and growing up with one parent just means that you have to rely on your village a little bit more. So I just like to take a second to thank everyone who's been a part of that. And these are not everyone in these pictures. It's just what I had time to, to put in. And um, I'm very grateful for all of you and all the support and all the family dinners that I've been invited to and just really opening up your hearts to me and pushing me. So um, thank you very much for that. And just all the support that I got, I just wanna be able to also extend um, to other children. And so what I hope to kind of get out of this presentation, um, I really wanna work on something to help children, um, or I guess people, but specifically children who have kind of had a loss of someone who's been climbing. And the American Alpine Club has this amazing program called the Climbing Grief Fund. And they, um, I think they offer some scholarships or something. And they also have this amazing kind of resource bank, like this mental health directory of these therapists who specialize in, um, you know, losses from climbing and things like that. And they have this great story archive where people who lost um, someone to climbing, like they tell their story and things like that. So it'd be really cool if we could, um, started to think about how we could possibly do something like this in Canada. Um, yeah, and to kind of end off, um, yeah, so if you're able to donate, um, that would be super appreciated. Um, we'd prefer e-transfer just because with the donate button on our society website, we lose 3% of the transaction, but either way is fine. And then if you have um, 
if you'd like to chat about anything about this presentation or if something resonated with you or um, I'd love to have a conversation about what we could kind of do to help support people more in Canada who've been through similar experiences to me. Um, and as a final thing, I just wanted to show another really clip, really quick 20 second clip um, of Martin again on his sailboat. And um, yeah, I just, yeah, so I'll just, I'll just share that. And it just shows how much passion that he had and he had so much joy for life. And I just hope that moving forward, um, especially now with everything happening in the world, we can try um, and find the things in life that bring us joy and do that because life is really short. Uh, we don't know when it's gonna be taken away from us. Um, so we should cherish it while we can. So I will just play the last clip. Yeah, and that's the end of my presentation. So thank you very much for coming.